2.6. The Clear Toss. You've turned your big long list of 50 to 100 one-line ideas into 20 to 30 one-paragraph ideas. And now you've picked the storylines, you're going to work them up into something longer. So now you need to write those stories out as a series of beats or moments in the story. Don't even think of them as scenes yet. That will come at the outlining stage. See chapter 2.12. Get the story straight and you can figure out the rest later. But before you even do that, let us consider the quest of the hero and how it works dramatically. Obscure example. A few years ago, there was a sitcom called The Persuasionists. It was not a success, despite a cast that included the extraordinarily funny Simon Farnaby and the extremely likeable Adam Buxton. Episode 2 made me laugh a lot, and I thought the show had some potential, but it never came together. BBC Two buried the show after Newsnight and then dumped the last episode on a Saturday night. This is, I guess they're right... The show will have cost them about a million pounds, so frankly they can do whatever they like with it. Many were vitriolic about the show, saying things like, I could have told them at the start why that show was never going to work. The fact is, for me at least, episode 2 did work quite well, so clearly the setting and characters were not inherently flawed. Overall though, the plots fell down on their lack of clarity. For example, the last episode featured the boss, played by the very watchable Jared Christmas, wanting to make the office more Australian, which is a funny enough idea in principle, But what did he mean by that? There seemed no way of knowing when the office was Australian enough to satisfy the boss. We didn't know how well the characters were succeeding at any given time because the boss did not give terms of success. In another episode, maybe the fifth, the boss told the characters to be more creative or prove their creativity and a threat was issued. Threats are good, they give the characters incentives. Challenges are even better as long as we know what success and failure look like. In that episode, the next thing we knew, two of the characters went to buy ultra-cool trainers for no clear reason. It then transpired that they simply wanted to look creative, but the challenge was to be more creative and not look more creative. It was very nebulous, and I was left wondering, what's going on and what are the characters trying to do? The mantra. If I, the viewer, don't know what success for the characters looks like, or what they're trying to achieve, I don't know if they're winning or losing at any point in the show. As I say many times on my blog... Confusion is the enemy of comedy. An audience that is baffled can't laugh. I've learnt this from bitter experience. I've written a few sitcom episodes for Radio 4, which sounded terribly clever and complex, but the audience just didn't know what was happening, so the laughs dried up. This is not to say there is no place for randomness or bizarre events in the show. A show can have random beats, moments and unexpected events, of course, but they happen within a context. If that context is chaos, confusion reigns and confusion is the enemy of comedy. When storylining Miranda with uh, Miranda Hart and Richard Hurst, I came up with a term that we use quite a lot. It was the clear toss. It was an abbreviation for clearly defined terms of success. It works better written down. That is to say, when the character has succeeded, it is obvious and demonstrated with a single gesture or object or reveal. Isn't this a bit contrived? Of course it is, but this is a sitcom. It is, by its very nature, a contrivance. The audience know that people aren't that funny in real life. They are suspending disbelief. They are offering you their hand. You have to take that hand and guide them. You blindfold them and send them spinning at your peril. They are unlikely to thank you for this. Incidentally, this is why dumb characters are very useful. The characters get to explain what's happening to them. They sit there looking vacant and someone says, ''Look, if we don't sell all those watermelons by 5pm, we're all fired.'' Or, hey, don't drop that painting or we'll all owe Mr Peterson £5 million. Comprende? You get the idea. Hooray for idiots, they really do make life clearer for the rest of us. Whatever you set your characters doing each week, whatever the quest is, we need to know the terms of success and failure. It could be as simple as getting Dad to say, I'm wrong, or getting Jennifer to run down the street in a giraffe costume, or telling someone they love them. Whatever it is, it needs to be clear. Crystal clear. Idiot proof, so that even a TV exec can understand it when they read the script or go to the read through. Comprende? An example. To illustrate and expand this, let's look at Bluestone 4 2 Series 1, Episode 3. It's probably on YouTube or BitTorrent somewhere if you want to have a look, or buy it on DVD, that'd be nice. In this episode, Nick is desperate to prove to Mary that he's not only interested in one thing, which is obviously sex generally, even though he is only interested in one thing. Meanwhile, Simon is trying to get his memoir published and Mac and Rocket are bickering over Celtic versus Hibs. Richard Hurst and I took ages to calibrate the clear toss. Let's start with Simon's memoir, which we assume is dreadful, and we get hints of that in the scene when it's revealed. But we avoided making too much of the quality of the book, because we try to avoid stories that rely on artistic endeavour here, 
C 2.4.6. What we focused on was Mary giving Simon a quest that meant it didn't matter what the book was like. Let's face it, hundreds of lousy books get published every year. Simon's quest was to get a hook and a look. A hook was a story about himself to give the publishers an angle, and a look was a compelling picture of himself. If he can get those two things, he's got a book, by which we imply a book deal. It's a clear quest, and even better, the three components of it rhyme. Book, hook, look. Simon goes about trying to achieve his hook and look, and we can see how he's doing. And when he gets them all, he says to Bird, Hook, tick, look, tick, I'm sorted, before he has his hook and look taken away. He walks off like Charlie Brown, or various characters in Arrested Development, having failed in his quest. Clear. Hot prop. The other story is Nick's attempts to woo Mary, which involve trying to look like he's deep and meaningful and not just obsessed with sex. This crops up with a revelation about the journalist who's obsessed with him, and then Nick tries to convince Mary that he's not just after one thing, but fails. So we clarify his quest when he talks to Bird, hence, Nick, how am I going to try to prove to Mary that I'm not only interested in one thing? Bird, stop trying to have sex with her. Nick, yeah, but if I do that, how am I going to have sex with her? Bird, hmm, the eternal conundrum. We wanted to remind Nick of Mary and this conundrum much later, when Astrid, the rescued aid worker, is trying to be grateful to Nick in his quarters. A memorable form of words is okay, but a physical, tangible, hot prop is better. So we came up with a tin of cashew nuts. A tin is funnier than a bag, not sure why. Mary has been sent some cashew nuts by her slightly useless dad, and she can't even eat them, so she gives them to Nick. Nick gratefully receives them and says to Mary, Every time I put one of these in my mouth, I shall think of you. It works nicely as a line at the time, but even better when it comes back to haunt him later and really cramps his style with Astrid. The cashews are there in his hand and Astrid wants to know where the nuts are from and Nick talks about the Padre and suddenly realises he needs to apply the brakes. If you can turn a prop into something significant that indicates the plot or a past conversation or promise, you're on to something.